Good afternoon. So it's exciting. Isn't this neat? For those of you that have been at the other sessions, I, I like this configuration. That way we don't feel like we're talking to everybody all the way back. Even though I love Sinclair. Don't get us wrong. We love being at Sinclair. Well, good afternoon. I'm County Commissioner Debbie Lieberman. And on behalf of my fellow commissioners, Judy Dodge, who's up here in the front row, and Dan Foley, um, thank you for joining us. Uh, we, the commissioners, are very excited about this process, and we're just looking forward to, to what we're going to learn over the next few months. Along with my role as commissioner, I'm also a member of the board of the United Way of Greater Dayton and co-chair of the Education and Life Skills uh, Work Group, along with my friend back here behind me, uh, Dr. Anissa Cheek. And if there are any other co-chairs, I know you're in here, of, of our other two teams, would you raise your hand? Commissioner Dodge? Dave? Yeah, great. So, um, we began this series of panel discussions with an excellent start last Thursday. And this is our fifth and final of the series. We've heard a lot of very good information from all of our panelists, and we're looking forward to this panel this afternoon. Um, and with that, I am going to turn it over now to my co-chair. Thank you, Commissioner Lieberman. Um, as the commissioner stated, my name is Anissa Cheek. I'm the vice president of the School and Community Partnerships Division at Sinclair Community College. Um, I'm also a member of the Donor Relations Council of United Way. Um, I'm also, uh, as she said, co-chair of the uh, Life uh, Education and Life Skills work, work Group. And this process is a really good example of the partnership that exists between the United Way and the county. And it really demonstrates how we are aligning community resources um, and strengthening uh, the collaborative efforts between the organizations to ensure that we are adequately identifying and addressing uh, community issues. So with that, um, we're going to, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Tom Maltzby. He's going to give us a little bit more background information, give us some more details about how the panel is going to flow today. So Tom. Hey, thank you, Anissa. Um, Actually, I'm going to keep it a little bit more high level, and I'm going to let the other Tom tell you about the details and how the panel and all that's going to flow today. But uh, I want to welcome you all, panelists, and, and those of you who are here. Uh, we've had a, a wonderful series of panel presentations around data that we've been able to collect in our joint process uh, with Montgomery County. Um, I should have said so. I'm Tom Mosby, President and CEO of United Way. And we have just been thrilled at the outcome. There have been themes uh, that have evolved in all of the panels uh, that we think are going to be helpful in terms of how we validate and, and verify data. And uh, it's just been a wonderful experience so far. Uh, I'm really excited about what we're doing in our partnership uh, with Family and Children's First Council. Uh, we began the early portion of the process last summer uh, when we released our shared community needs assessment. And I'm sure many of you have seen that. Uh, the, strategic plan, st the strategic planning process will continue through the fall in several phases that will include several large meetings um, with all of the members as well as a series of meetings uh, with our three work groups. And uh, we are very confident that as we churn through this data, uh, we're coming up with some information that will be really good fodder for strategies. Uh, all of these meetings will foster a review and discussion of the results of the panels as well as looking at models that may work here and best practices that we find uh, from other places and in other communities. And through that, we remain committed to integrating all three of our areas, education and life skills, income and stability, and health and safety. Uh, and we do understand the correlation between those. We know they're not silos. We know they, uh, they do work together uh, to bring about the best possible outcome and solutions for the people we serve. The overall purpose of this process is to emerge with a set of common priorities, uh, early state strategies and actions to increase community alignment um, as we guide the service delivery approach and improve results uh, for individuals, families, and children uh, through a more intentional collective uh, process, collective impact process, I should say, um, as we do it together. So now with more details about this process today, and uh, what we're looking to do with you, here's Tom Kelly. Thank you, Tom. I'm Tom Kelly, Assistant Montgomery County Administrator. So what we're doing is conducting five community discussion panels. Today is our fifth panel, as you've heard. Um, I would like to add my thanks to the panel. Thanks to all of you for being here. 
and just simply you know, say a couple of things and, and move on so we can start the panel discussion. What we have done is organize these five panels around topics that really rose from our community needs assessment that was done collaboratively between Montgomery County and the FCFC and United Way of Greater Dayton. We identified those things that came from interviews, focus groups, having discussion with agency, with agency directors from the community, clients that receive services, the full complement of people that are really involved in how services operate in the community and um, for the community. So we could develop that into a really a written product that will exist and, and will continue to be used that has data, statistics, all, those kind, all that kind of information in it. Our thought was that having the panel discussion would add a context to that information. We bring people together that have expertise in the subject areas, people that have experience in using the system, people that can really provide perspectives on those topic areas and help add another layer of information and again, more context to the kind of information that you find in the needs assessment. So that information along with the needs assessment can move into the work groups that will be operating through June and July and into August. As you've heard, our ultimate goal is to develop a strategic plan with a manageable set of priorities, strategies, and some level of actions to move into implementation as we move into the fall, early winter of, of this year. We are really pleased to be able to provide you with this information to, to uh, today provide a conclusion to this part of the process, to this phase of the process. So with that, I'm going to hand off to Beth Welly, who will be your facilitator this afternoon, and then we'll move into the panel discussions. Thank you very much. So I briefly want to go over what you can expect today. Um, before you, you have six learned panelists who are going to share their opinion with you. Um, I know that if you picked up the handout on the way in, you saw the questions that we're going to be discussing today. And I want to share with you that we worked from hundreds of questions to narrow down the questions for each panel. <clears throat> we will not be hearing from every panelist on each question, all right? Um, the panelists will be answering specific questions and they have prepared in order to make this discussion the most meaningful for everyone in the room. Um, because there is a lot of information to cover here, we are not able to take questions and comments from the audience today. However, we covet your questions and comments. So if you didn't pick up an index card on the way in or a couple of index cards on the way in, I encourage you to, to make some other notes or zip out and pick up some index cards. And at the end of today's discussion, there will be red buckets out there where we will gather those questions and comments. And all of your comments then will go into the process that Tom and Tom have earlier discussed. So your comments and questions are very important and, and we want them today. Um, as, a, as a quick little housekeeping note, I'd like to make sure that everybody's cell phone is off or turn to vibrate, please. Um, I believe everyone got, there is one panelist who brought a handout. I believe everyone got that handout. If you don't have that handout, please know that there are extra copies on the table on the way out. We are limiting our panelists to three minutes for each answer. Um, and again, that is because otherwise we could probably be here for a week talking about this issue. <coughs> Um, but other information that they have will be shared later in the process. Um, and I believe that is all I have to share in the way of preparation, and we will get right into the discussion. So let me quickly introduce our panelists <clears throat> from, from my side out. We have um, Richard Stock with the University of Dayton, Richard Wegman from Miami Valley Works, Natasha Spears from Boys and, Girls, Boys and Girls Clubs of Dayton, sorry about that. Adrian McLemore, who's with us from Goodwill Easter Seals, Miami Valley, but something I want to share with you 
in all of the five panels, we have had, we have included someone on the panel who has a, a different perspective on the issues we're talking about today, who has an experiential perspective. And Adrian has a personal story, he has a personal perspective that I'm sure he'll share in, in his answers as we go along. Tom Lasley from Learn to Earn Dayton and Michael Carter from Sinclair Community College. All right, so thank you panelists. And now let's move to the first question. So question number one, <clears throat> and we will begin with um, Michael Carter is what education, employment, jobs, and wages strategies have the potential to provide the greatest impact across all three of the focus areas? And again, the focus areas are education and life skills, health and safety, income and stability. Michael, would you begin? Behind me, as they come up, you'll see some slides as it relates to, uh, related to uh, Dr. Johnson's uh, State of the College address that he gave a few weeks ago at Sinclair Community College. And then in your handouts, there are additional slides. Some I'll cover and some will be interspersed in some of the questions. Uh, specifically at Sinclair, we've done several things uh, to try to impact all three focus areas. One is we've redesigned our student support one-stop center to provide, and uh, to provide special support to our most at-risk students. We're designing and implementing a national UAS training and certification center. Uh, we're designing and implementing a new health sciences strategy uh, in which some of you in the room have been a part of, of that advisory committee. Um, additionally, we've designed four new degree and 13 new certificate programs. We had uh, 1,900 high school students take transferable college credit this year and on schedule to have another uh, 2,700 uh, to take, those, take, take college credit courses next year and we continue to have the lowest tuition in the state. Very good, thank you. Tom, same uh, question. Three things that I would argue are essential. The first is, um, uh, and by the way, I do not have PowerPoints. As, uh, I know some of you are aware I'm a member of PAP, which is Professionals Against PowerPoint, <laughs> uh, and so I don't have any PowerPoints. Um, but I respect Michael for, uh, for having them. Uh, three things, first of all, one of the things that uh, we're dealing with is a lot of high school counselors who simply have not been prepared uh, to deal with the kind of uh, issues that are associated with college and career readiness. Uh, they went through educational programs. Uh, they were well trained for their time, but they have not really been uh, educated to the kind of demands that we see for uh, the 21st century schools. Uh, some states like Michigan are actually recertif recertifying their counselors. Uh, and making sure that the counselors have the skill set that they need to help uh, work with young people. Ohio has not been aggressive in this regard. It's a problem not just for the state, it's a problem for Montgomery County. Uh, we also don't have enough high school counselors in our schools. Um, if you talk to any of the superintendents or any of the high school principals, they'll tell you their ratio is uh, 1 to 300 or 1 to 400, or I suppose there are some where it's even 1 to 500. And to suppose that we can give good counseling to young people at those ratios is ludicrous. So uh, if we're going to really help young people, we need to, to find ways to deal with the counselor situation. Second thing is trying to create internships uh, for our young people, especially uh, the young people who come from the higher poverty environments. Those of us who come from middle and upper middle class families, we prepared our young people. We ensured that our children had those kind of experiences. That's not assured for young people coming from higher poverty family uh, environments. And we've, we have to find um, we have to find those kinds of opportunities. Um, the third one has to do with uh, summer and after school programming, uh, especially again for our higher poverty students. I know uh, the county has uh, had an aggressive strategy around youth works and trying to get more of our young people involved in work opportunities. Uh, if we're hoping to accomplish the goals that we want to accomplish around uh, uh, ensuring that our young people have marketable skills when they graduate, uh, then it's going to be absolutely imperative that we provide the kind of uh, summer and after school programming that's going to enable uh, young people from all socioeconomic areas uh, and all income uh, uh, levels to have the skill set and the experiences that will enable them to be successful once they enter the world of work. So uh, those are my three uh, counselors, internships, 
and more viable and vital uh, work experiences for our young people, both uh, after school and during the summer. Excellent, thank you. Adrian? Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first off, I want to say thanks for having me. There, I think there are four key issues that have to be addressed, and not only just as young people, but the adult uh, population as well. And I speak from a, both a professional side and being a employee at Goodwill Easter Seals, but also um, former JFS, and then also as a consumer of services, considering that I grew up in foster care. So I've literally gone through the revolving door of the things that I think that we have to address. Um, one of the things I think is job readiness before the actual employment. Uh, I see this a lot during my current capacity, but also there was a, we're all focusing in the workforce development side of the National Career Readiness Training Certificate. Uh, and I was looking at a study that said 90% would probably qualify or, or um, <clears throat> meet for those uh, high paying jobs, excuse me, but only 45% were meeting their requirements. And that's for those with a high level of education. If you drop that down to low level education, there was about 65% who they thought would qualify, but only 19% were meeting the qualifications. So essentially, what the study was saying is that we think that although we have these high paying jobs and we have these jobs ready, these people are coming to us without the essential skills to do the job, and that's a huge problem. The second thing I would talk about is addressing transportation issues, and that spans across the globe in terms of not just jobs, but also education. There was a study of about 4,000 people across eight um, major cities, and they found that 26% of parents did not take their kids to school. A quarter of them didn't have ways of transporting the kids to and from. And now you translate that to a job, what if I have a job that does not run on the bus line? So a job that would normally, a job that would normally take half an hour in a car now takes me two and a half hours depending on the bus schedule. So addressing transportation is a huge barrier. And then the elephant in the room, mental health assessments up front. We often find out about mental health after we've already come in contact with the consumer. And if we do those assessments up front, uh, we reduce costs, we identify significant challenges that they may have, but also they have a greater chance of long-term stability. And then uh, lastly, which does not cost money but is very hard to implement, is we have to have realistic expectations that this is a constant work in progress. And I think sometimes with the way that we fund government and the way that we approach issues that we have in our society, we approach it with a plan, a strategic plan, steps, but then we don't go back and retweak it and rework it and try to navigate and say, okay, now that we've run into this barrier, how do we get around it? So, those are the four things that I would address. Very good, thank you. Natasha. Um, there are three things that I would actually address. Um, one, first, is, is academic learning time, and, and not talking about the number of days the students are re required to spend in school, but the, the amount of time that they spend um, in the classroom learning new concepts. Most of the time, our kids, and, and working with children every day, I hear more about part tests and OGTs than I do about opportunities to learn new concepts, new ideas, those things that create in us the, the desire to be lifelong learners. So we've got to figure out a way within our school systems to provide young people with the opportunity to learn new concepts, to take them outside um, of their, the four walls that are sometimes barriers for them. Um, additionally, youth employment opportunities and, and much to Adrian's point, not just providing them jobs, but providing them quality work experiences where they're learning real skills. A lot of times what I see with um, a lot of our youth employment programs is we give those young people grunt jobs. We don't give them opportunities to work in the office, to answer phones, to learn how to file, to attend meetings. We want them to be the custodian, the, the lunchroom helper. So we need to create opportunities for young people to gain experience that helps to prepare them for real life work experience. Experience. And then finally, mentoring. A critical piece is a lot of the kids that we work with who are in low to moderate income households, parents are either um, just completely absent or are working so hard just to make ends meet, they can't provide their young people with quality experiences. So having people from the business community to come alongside young people to provide that personal motivation and create opportunities and experience for them that will move them outside of the communities in which they reside, I think are, are critical pieces. Excellent. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Richard Wegman, are you comfortable? I'm good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, first, let me ask a question. How many people are familiar with Miami Valley Works that have heard of it? Okay, a few of you. Great. That's perfect. That's great. Well, uh, Miami Valley Works is a, it's a model that is uh, it's a poverty to self-sufficiency model. 
And basically what we're doing is we're working with people who are economically disadvantaged and we're moving them to self-sufficiency. So the first step of that process obviously is a job placement, but we go through a job skills readiness training uh, workshop, which actually is part of the, uh, the first question here. Uh, life skills is uh, very, very important. But the whole model is a long-term retention and advancement program. In other words, we'll put somebody in a job, but that's just basically the starting point. From that point forward through the first year, we have employment coaches that work with these individuals to keep them in that job so that they can achieve some level of economic stability. Once they have that economic stability at the one year mark, they become what we call members for life. At that point, they avail themselves of our advancement specialists who then work with them to develop a career plan and move them up from an unskilled entry level job to a job that potentially could be uh, self-sufficient, a sustainable wage. We realize this may take five to seven years to move these individuals, but here's the point. The point is, is we're not a temporary placement agency. What we are all about is a long-term retention and advancement program. This program is based upon Cincinnati Works, which some of you may have heard of. It's been in business for 20 years. They are a proven demonstrated model in terms of moving people from poverty to self-sufficiency. We are replicating that model here in Dayton. It's got uh, private funding. Uh, we have three years of runway. We're looking at fourth year funding now, but the community is solidly behind this. We have the Dayton Business Committee, the Dayton Foundation, a number of groups that are very, very interested in this program and how it can move people from poverty to self-sufficiency. We're also very, very lucky to have a gentleman in our team who happens to be on this panel. Adrian Mecklemore is uh, part of our team. He's one of the employment coaches, and um, uh, we feel that we've assembled a great team to move these individuals uh, along the path to self-sufficiency. So we think the strategies that we're pursuing here fall directly within uh, question number one. So Excellent. Thank you very much. And Richard Stock, will you conclude for us? Sure. Well, fundamentally, it starts in that zero to five age range. If you don't have things that help... Uh, low-income families with small children at that point, then they're dead in the water as soon as, you know, by the time they get to kindergarten. So you have to have early childhood education, and even before the early childhood education, you have to get interventions that help uh, those families, and I'm not talking about children, I am talking about families. You have to have interventions that help those families in that zero to three age range. So what it constitutes then, that high quality preschool that people talk about, a high quality preschool is one that is deeply engaged with the family. And it's a high quality experience in the sense that the family is involved in determining what happens, right? There's lots of evidence on this. And all the evidence says that you have to have what gets defined in that technical literature as a two generation approach. It's a weird thing to talk about it as a two-generation approach because it would be a lot simpler to simply indicate that you are working with a family, right? So that it's just not a matter of making sure that uh, some mother gets her child to your preschool classroom it, and therefore then you will take over the education of that child. It really is a situation of involving the family in making that education experience possible, supplementing that education experience by the variety of activities that you talk with the family about in terms of what they can do uh, at home. But here's the other thing about all these issues, and it's a theme I'll try and develop over these next set of questions. What is occurring now is a crime against people. Poverty is a crime that the culture is perpetrating on a subset of people in the culture. And that crime continues to occur. So it's not just go out, it's not just that you go out and you hit this guy today, right? You hit them and that you continue to hit them for at least the first 18 years of their life and then it continues. So the consequences of that poverty don't just stop at age five, Right? They continue all through the set of a variety of additional experiences that people are talking about. So all of these particular strategies that flow right, through the childhood's experiences of children 
All of those are of importance. Thank you. Well, that leads us nicely into our second question, and this question will be answered by Michael, Tom, and Richard Stock. Given that childhood poverty can have negative effects on future health and education attainment, and can lead to intergenerational poverty, what are the most effective ways for the health and human services system to intervene? Michael, we'd like to start with you. I think one of the most important things is we have to continue uh, our close relationship with initiatives such as Learn to Earn, specifically uh, Ready, Set, Soar, uh, City of Learners, Montgomery County College Promise Program. Uh, we also have to inform families. Uh, so often we convene to talk about issues, but we don't include families in that. There are thousands of well-intentioned uh, parents uh, and, and families in the community, and we just have to give them a script. Personally, my, my parents had a ninth and eighth grade education. They just needed a script to know uh, what to do as far as my future is concerned. You know, I, I guess it's similar to having, uh, you know, I, I go to the doctor, and this is an analogy I use uh, often, go to the doctor, and, and the doctor and nurse talk between, you know, among themselves about what I need to do, but never let me know. And if, you know, they need, if they tell me, hey, you need to exercise more, you need to stop eating uh, poorly, uh, then I can affect that. You know, I can do some things to, to help. And we just have to help our, our parents uh, along and, and help them be knowledgeable. Uh, also, and, and Richard's mentioned this as well, uh, provide high quality preschool to all of our three and four year olds. I think that's important. A child's zip code should not determine uh, their opportunity for success. Thank you. Tom? Uh, two things. First, to follow up on Mike, uh, Michael's uh, one point, uh, I think one of the real strengths of Montgomery County is the incredible amount of collaboration that occurs between and among a lot of the stakeholder groups. Um, if you, one of the privileges I've had is I've visited other uh, cities around the United States where they have strong efforts uh, toward fostering enhanced intellectual capital in their communities, one of the things you see is they're very siloed, incredibly siloed. So different people have different responsibilities, but there's a limited amount of communication between and among the stakeholders. And that limits, I think, what uh, uh, they're able to achieve. Um, the collective impact folks, uh, the people who study this phenomenon, uh, out of Stanford and, other, uh, and out of other research entities, They've, they've discovered that the communities that are siloed never move their metrics, never move their numbers. Uh, it's only the communities that do have collaboration between and among stakeholder groups that are able to begin to move uh, the, the performance metrics in their communities. And I think we are incredibly well positioned uh, to do that in Montgomery County. Uh, the second thing is to play off uh, a little bit of a theme that I see emerging here, and that's uh, around the early learning. Right now, um, uh, one of the problems that we have is we don't have strong incentive systems for a lot of the early uh, learning providers to try to uh, go toward enhanced ratings, uh, that is, go toward three, four, and five star ratings. Um, as your rating goes up, your cost goes up, and so a lot of providers begin to go, what's the, what's the return on my investment if I really go up to a four or five star rating? What does that mean in terms of the cost structure that, that I'm going to incur? And that is, a, that is a huge problem. So we have to figure out how to, how to deal with that. How do we incentivize? And this is both a state policy issue. I know that, uh, I know that at the county level, uh, the commissioners and others are trying to explore this issue. How do we get at it? But if we're going to get at two things, cost and availability, we have to deal with that. Um, just to read very quickly, um, uh, this was in a piece that someone sent me today. Uh, capturing the problem, said our child care problem is really a cluster of issues. First, there is cost. On average, according to one report, parents of an infant in Massachusetts spend $16,549 per year for child care. $16,500. And the other is the issue of quality. Quality is inconsistent and not great. Overall, more than 80% of daycare centers nationwide are rated merely as fair. And we have to make sure that what we provide in Montgomery County is of the very highest quality, especially for our neediest young people, if we're going to try to achieve 
uh, the goals that we want to try to achieve uh, as a county and as communities. Very good. Thank you. Richard. Richard Stock. Uh, well, I'm going to try not to be the angry person, but I really have difficulty with that. I think fundamentally within the current structure, the fundamental thing that we need to do is to make sure that all eligible families receive with the least amount of difficulty all income transfers that are due to them. I'm an economist. Economists, I'll tell you, income is good. But just in case you didn't think necessarily that income and good is good and that poverty somehow builds character, there's evidence on what the impact is of raising people's income at lower income levels. We had this natural experiment called the Earned Income Tax Credit. And there was a big boast in the Earned Income Tax Credit in the 90s. So some economists, you know, uh, wrote a big research article that appeared in the American Economic Review in 2012, and it said, gee, was there any impact from that big boost in the income of low-income Americans as a result of that uh, earned income tax credit? Well, you know, yes, there is. And you, in fact, can see two different things that start to occur. But I'll just read you sort of the detailed element just for that precision or that quantitative precision that you would like from economists. Their baseline estimates imply that a $1,000 increase in income raises combined math and reading test scores by 6% of a standard deviation in the short run. Test gains are larger for children from disadvantaged families. We'll go into later as to why there might be that direct relationship uh, between uh, income and educational results. But then I'll just do one else. It's not just education, right? Income transfers, right? There's a lot of evidence that income transfers directly improve self-reported child and maternal mental health, right? So you, you recognize all the pathways by which getting additional resources into the family matter. So at a fundamental thing, to the extent that we're continuing to perpetrate this crime on people, the least that we can do through our existing bureaucracies is to make sure that everybody gets what they are legally entitled to in terms of income transfers. Thank you. All right, let's move to question three, and this is for Tom, Adrian, and Natasha. Continuing somewhat on this theme of school-aged children, what are the most consequential non-academic barriers for school-aged children and how do we address them? So we'll start with Tom, go to Adrian, and conclude with Natasha. So I, I, have, I identified just two uh, points on this one uh, that I, I, felt, um, I, I felt were relevant. The first was uh, trying to find ways to incentivize the success sequence in Montgomery County for our families. Those of you who have heard me uh, speak in the past know that I, I talk about the sec success sequence. It's not my idea. It really comes from the research literature. It's basically that if you graduate from high school, if you get uh, a post-secondary credential of some type, if you then get a job and then enter into a committed relationship and only have a child after you've followed those steps, high school diploma, post-secondary credential, job, hold the job for a period of like something like a year, and then enter into a committed relationship uh, and have a child in that committed relationship. Only about 2% of the people in the United States live in poverty who followed that sequence. Basically, the people who live in poverty uh, generally are living there because they either had children too early or they don't have any sort of post-marketable uh, 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 po uh, marketable uh, skills that allow them to create a, a living wage for themselves uh, as adults. Uh, there are certainly people who live in poverty who, for whom that is not true. And, and out of no fault of their own, they're there. I absolutely will grant that point. My point is a lot of people simply don't follow the success sequence. We have to find ways to incentivize that as opposed to de-incentivize it, which I think oftentimes happens uh, in our communities. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is uh, the absence of uh, mixed income communities uh, in our region. Uh, we have to find ways to create more mixed income uh, uh, neighborhoods, especially in some of the poorest areas uh, of the county. Um, if you look at what some communities around the United States are doing, uh, uh, Columbus is, is now exploring this, Cincinnati is now exploring it, Atlanta, 
uh, they have really begun to try to determine how they can create more mixed income uh, communities because when you're, a, when you're in poverty and you're in a mixed income uh, community, you have a better chance of making it out of poverty uh, in that circumstance. There are role models, there are incentives to try to move you out of poverty if you can see around you people who are in a different social and economic circumstance. What we now have far too frequently are neighborhoods where the poverty is concentrated and there are not enough uh, alternative options for the, for the people the na to, to, to see and to explore so that they can reach their full potential. So those are two things that I see as essential uh, in terms of trying to deal with some of the uh, non-academic uh, uh, issues that, uh, that are often evidenced in schools. Excellent. Adrian? Well, the first thing is it's, it's always interesting to be on a panel full of experts and they have all these scholarly opinions about how you grew up. Um, and I don't mean that sarcastically, I mean that truthfully simply because you always wonder why me or why things happen like that and so on and so forth since I did grow up. Uh, first off, a lot of poverty is generational. Uh, my mother was in poverty, my, her mother was in poverty because she didn't have an education and you can trace back my family history. Um, but some of the non-academic areas, one first as it involves young people, uh, productive uses of idle time. We don't have enough productive uses of all the idle time that they have. If you are not an athlete or if you are not scholarly, then what options do you have to succeed if you're in secondary education? So that's one of the things. Um, and it showed, I was reading some studies and preparing for this. A lot of young people love volunteering. They just don't have a lot of opportunities to volunteer because they don't know what's out there. And if you, don't, if you have a single parent home, that mom or dad does not have, always have the time and investment to help that young person. So mentoring is another huge factor. And Natasha mentioned this. My mentoring came, believe it or not, when I was growing up in a single home, my mentoring came from mimicking people on TV. Um, Bob Barker in his suits. Uh, David Letterman, who just retired, I would stay up because David Letterman was the only guy I got to see sometimes because I didn't have a dad. So I watched David Letterman every night since I was a kid. And now I don't have David Letterman anymore. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is mental health, seriously. And I mean this, my mom is schizophrenic and bipolar. And so if you, can have, if you have that type of person raising three young people, what do you expect her to truly do in terms of making sure her kids are self-sufficient or interdependent? We teach this independent model where we want young people to be independent when they grow up and get out and become 18. But the truth is no one in this world has ever been truly independent. And so if we're completely, completely dependent upon services from the government or social agencies and then at 18, we, we want you to be independent, you just threw off our whole entire system and that's a huge, huge problem. Self-esteem and stress. Young people, especially in single parent homes, have to focus a lot on maintaining the household because no one else is there to do it. And so if you have a mom or a dad and they're a single person, you have often older siblings taking care of young siblings. You often have younger siblings out finding jobs early or getting involved in drugs and activities to help supplement the income. You have a lot of kids out here in the street doing all uh, God knows what. And so when you talk about the self-esteem and stress that a young person is going through, we don't address that whatsoever. We don't address that how we're going to deal with that to make them more successful and make them interdependent because truth be told, again, if it weren't for mentoring and the services that I received, I would be the person on the street uh, or I would be the person sitting across from my office when I'm meeting with these young people because I got involved in some type of services, but everyone is not as lucky as I am and we have to make that mainstream. Thank you. Natasha? Um, I won't talk a, little, a lot about poverty because it's already been touched upon, but I think one of the things that I notice with the young people that I work with in terms of poverty is that there is an absence of um, that special aspect of childhood being protected and prolonged. So young people living in poverty don't get to be children for the normal amount of time. They're forced, as, as Adrian just spoke to, to grow up because you're taking care of younger sisters or younger brothers or paying bills. Um, I, similar experience, my mother was medic depressive. So at 13, I learned how to, to pay bills, buy groceries and everything because she simply couldn't. So. You know, I've been an adult since I was 13 years old. I'm 44 now. You do the math. Um, also, race and ethnicity. Um, young people, even in schools in their own community who feel um, discriminated against, feel deflated about education because the expectations for them are lowered. They, they, it's all automatically set up to, they're automatically set up to believe they won't be successful, so why attempt 
to be successful. So that, that's a huge issue um, in terms of barriers. And, and one of the other things is social competence. What we know is that um, children who are socially competent um, and emotionally competent do better academically. And so we focus a lot on early childhood education, but we don't focus a lot on helping young people to be socially and emotionally competent so that they can be academically successful. All right, thank you very much. All right, let's move on to question four. And this is for Natasha and Adrian. Um, how do we combat that hopelessness or fear that can be self-perpetuating um, in poverty and unemployment? Natasha, I'd like to begin with you, and then we'll conclude with Adrian. You know, ultimately, I think you have to pay people a living wage. You have to give people the opportunity to get out of poverty. If you perpetuate the system that keeps people in poverty, you can't look at them and say, well, what's your problem? Why won't you fix it? If we aren't paying, if you're paying somebody $7.95 an hour, they have to pay $50 a month to get a bus pass to get to work, pay, you know, a babysitter $100 a week to watch their child while they're at work. In what way, form, or fashion do they have to get out of poverty? There simply is none. I think the other aspect of that is that there is a um, penalty for asset accumulation for, for, for poor people. If I am on welfare and I, get a, I end up getting a, a, a tax return and I put that tax return in the bank so that I can save money to ultimately move out of the projects to get off of welfare, when I go see my caseworker, oh, you have $2,000 in the bank, so we're going to cut your food stamps and we're going to cut your check. So now I'm forced to spend that money in the bank. So it's, it's, this, it's, it's like that gerbil on the wheel there are no opportunities for poor people to stop being poor. Or you have underemployed people who are working part-time jobs but have the desire to work full-time jobs, or people who simply are unable to find jobs. So they're just we just have to create more opportunities for people to change their trajectory. I think the assumption is that because poverty is generational, that people want to be poor. Not so much. They want opportunities to change their life just like those in middle class and affluent communities, but those opportunities aren't there. Thank you. Adrian. Yes, I didn't, I didn't enjoy being poor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do we combat the hopelessness or fear is the question. Uh, and I think I, this is going to be simple in concept, um, but it's going to be difficult to implement, and it has to start with the utmost importance of this service providing agency. Um, and the cost will come in training, but to actually do this in terms of getting it down to the employees is truly free. Um, you combat hopelessness with hope. And here's what I mean by that. First, our work must be heartfelt. It absolutely has to be heartfelt. Consumers, particularly consumers who come to the job center doors or a social service agency, they can sense people's genuineness from across the table. They can sense if you really care about the work that you're doing and not looking at them as another number, another statistic, or another person that the 18,000 person that they've seen today. And so our work must be heartfelt. Secondly, we must be open-minded. Uh, we must be flexible in the delivery of our services because we get these directives and regulations and unfunded mandates that come down from on high, whether it's Columbus or uh, Washington or wherever, and it says it has to be this way. You can't go outside and deviate from this box. So we have to be open-minded. Uh, thirdly, we have to be persistent and realize that our consumers are expected to make mistakes. They are not going to change their life around in one meeting with a caseworker in 30 minutes. And it's just impossible to do that. Plans have to be changed, but we also, as a, consume, as a providing agency, that we're always willing to come back to the drawing board and help them out. And then finally, we have to be empowering. We have to give them the ability that consumers are ultimately responsible for their own lives. Uh, and that this, this is just another tool as a providing agency that we're giving them in their toolkit. Because as she said, we, people don't want to live in poverty forever. But in, in fact, if you penalize me for getting out of poverty, it's easier for me to retreat and stay in poverty. And so you combat hope, I mean, you combat hopelessness with hope, which is you have to be heartfelt, you have to be open-minded, you have to be persistent, and you have to be empowering. And why that does not cost you any money whatsoever. It's going to cost you in training. But if that is the culture and the mentality of your employees and your social providing agencies, that disseminates into your consumers. And that is what gets your consumers to come back to your agency to receive services until they're out of poverty. 